Hello and welcome. I'm Alex Promos, Head of Institutional Content and Investment Magazine, and this is Market Narratives. This show is a series of unorthodox conversations with thought leaders influencing the world of fiduciary investors. For more related insights and analysis, please remember to check out our website, investmentmagazine.com.au, and subscribe for a free email. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. Mike Green, Chief Strategist and Portfolio Manager at Simplify. Welcome to Market Narratives. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate it. So let's kick off with a pretty difficult but esoteric question around what are markets for today? Well, so the design of a financial market, and I'm, I'm, that's where we're going to go on this, obviously, is that it is designed to facilitate the allocation of capital, right? So you have primary and secondary issuers who are incurring certain costs on an operational or a regulatory framework to list their shares or their debt securities publicly. They're doing that and they're entering into those higher reporting relationships and the uh, the relationships associated with it because they hope to secure a lower cost of capital than they otherwise might, right? And the overall goal of a financial market is exactly that, to effectively calculate the cost of capital and to facilitate the allocation of capital by having intelligent, thoughtful participants looking at individual securities, whether those are debts or equities, and making a decision, do I think that this is a good investment at this price or a bad investment at this price? And if you do that on a large scale basis, it facilitates the allocation of capital in the same way that a Moroccan souk would facilitate the allocation of your consumption basket. Unfortunately, that doesn't appear what we view markets for anymore. Right. And across the globe, particularly in Western markets, we're seeing an increased emphasis on the idea that markets exist to deliver a certain outcome, right? A retirement goal or a savings vehicle. And this is a real challenge because that's not what markets do, right? Markets are not designed as savings vehicles. They're not designed as return vehicles that are supposed to offer an expected return of X that you can count on off into the future to deliver an appropriate retirement. And the fact that we've mixed those two, that increased Increasingly, governments are relying on markets to provide those retirement services and those retirement guarantees is unfortunately, I think, actually polluting the overall opportunity for capitalism. And and what markets are really designed to do is being muddied by this idea that they're designed for savings. In the United States, we have that in the form of 401ks and IRAs. In Australia, obviously, you have it in the form of superannuation funds. But it creates these interesting discussions around, well, how should we think about superannuation funds that are underperforming, right? There's been significant regulatory changes in Australia. You know, there is no such thing as, quote unquote, underperforming or outperforming. There's just what do they deliver in terms of returns? And unfortunately, I think taking ourselves off on a tangent that is going to be quite damaging to the the capitalism that underpins our uh, societies. I'm curious when you when you talk about sort of the this regulatory framework uh, and where you see it falls down because at the moment the conversation in Australia is really around how to make uh, capital allocated efficiently and make sure that people's retirement is secure and so they've tried to introduce these performance metrics as a way to improve obviously the managers and if the poor managers you know don't perform in quotations they need to step out of the market and that should hopefully drive better outcomes for people. Well, unfortunately, nobody fails to deliver returns that exceed the market because they are, quote unquote, bad at their job or because they're intentionally not being uh, incentivized enough, right? You can beat me as much as you want. It's not going to improve the results that I deliver to you from an investment perspective. And broadly speaking, that, that idea that we can treat the performance of investment managers as indicative of forward performance, right? So we're looking at the fact that they've trailed over a two-year period or an eight-year period or whatever time period you want to use in your regulatory framework, that we're using that as indicative of future performance is something that at least in the United States, we explicitly decry, right? We are told over and over again that you cannot present historical results as indicative of future results. And yet suddenly from a regulatory framework, we've decided that's how we want to behave. Now, the unfortunate fact is, is what this is doing is playing into the hands of the passive index providers, right? Because there's a fundamental misunderstanding around how markets actually work, right? The, we're, we're all familiar with the ideas of the quote unquote efficient market hypothesis that markets represent the best collective information. Unfortunately, that's not really how markets work because the requirements 
for the efficient market hypothesis are just unsustainable, right? It requires markets to be nearly infinitely elastic, meaning they can absorb extraordinary amounts of money before the prices are changed. We know that's not true, right? Anyone who's managed money knows that on very small sums of money, you can move a market, particularly illiquid markets. And the minute that becomes the case, what you begin to recognize is that the impact of the rise of passive strategies themselves is actually propelling these benchmarks in a fashion that leads people to believe markets are doing something different than they're actually doing, right? So a lot of my research is focused on this impact of passive investing. And one of the ironies that comes out of it is the more passive a market becomes, the more you rely on very simple algorithms that at least in the the official passive format operate on the world's simplest algorithms. Did you give me cash? If so, then buy. Did you ask for cash? If so, then sell. When you push these strategies, it perverts the return stream and creates a rising market that leads to the active managers having less and less alpha available to them, less and less potential for outperformance. And unfortunately, this is 180 degrees in the opposite direction of the prevailing narrative, exactly as you're referring to. The idea being that we can make the active managers perform better by simply removing the underperforming managers, right? It just doesn't work that way. It's a, it's a fascinating time because the whole premise that people think of is if, if passive investing is coming in, that that should make it actually easier for active managers to actually find opportunity. But actually, it's the reverse because the index is getting pushed up. Correct. And so what, what you end up with, and this is some of the shocking stuff that, that comes out of my research, you know, what, what you have done is you've changed the character of the market. And so, you know, proprietary research that I did um, focused on this idea of how do active managers respond to flows of capital and, and active managers by and large behave in a discounting fashion. So when you send capital to an active manager, they ask themselves the question, is this money better deployed into the market immediately? Or do I see at least based on some form of history, a superior return associated with waiting and holding this as cash for a better investment opportunity going forward. Passive vehicles don't have that filter. Again, that super simple algorithm. Did you give me cash? If so, then buy. Did you ask for cash? If so, then sell. They also hold no cash, right? So there is no reserve that's put into the market. And when you think about the impact of that, the typical active manager holds about 5% cash. The typical passive vehicle holds about 0.1% cash, 10 basis points of cash. The crazy outcome from that is that if you move a market that is 100% active to a market that is 100% passive with just those very simple rule changes, what you end up with is markets rising in price by almost 50x, not 50% or 5%, but 50 times. That creates a curvature in the return surface that anybody carrying cash or anybody choosing not to aggressively invest, even more aggressively invest in the market is naturally going to lag. And according to you know some of the regulatory changes, that just means they get fired and replaced with passive vehicles. It's fascinating because that ultimately represents market failure. And uh, it ultimately represents huge potential losses because you end up with greater spikes in volatility. We, you can only look back to sort of March 2020 when you had the, the drawdown alongside COVID. There was so much money in passive vehicles or related passive style products like some of these CTA style uh, strategies where as soon as it goes risk off, everything gets pulled down at the same time. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really the takeaway from the March 2020 events was not so much the even the speed or depth of the drawdown is the fact that everything got sold. Right. So going into the events of March 2020, what we've seen subsequently is companies like Microsoft or Zoom or Amazon were huge beneficiaries of the pandemic and the, the work from home environment. And this was actually painfully clear fairly early on, right? I wrote a a piece back in March, right around the lows, started writing it ahead of the lows, just released it basically on March 26 or three days after the lows, where I made exactly this prediction that, look, what we're actually seeing is a huge amount of stimulus. It should be very favorable for many of the largest companies. But there's a lot of companies that have been severely adversely affected on these events, whether that's because their capacity has been constrained, um, their end customer has gone away, right? You know, the office building companies, et cetera, should theoretically have been absolutely demolished. And we've not seen that, right? What we've seen is everything fell together. And then for the most part, everything rose together, right? To, to the perverse impact now that, you know, cruise lines are trading at higher valuations than they were going into the events, even though cruise lines are really just barely getting reopened, right? So we have no idea what the underlying stable demand function looks like. 
I, I lay that at the feet of passive investing and, and the underlying feature of if I choose to sell the S&P 500 or the ASX, I'm going to end up selling everything right? If I'm selling Australian futures, I'm selling everything. It doesn't matter what it is, right? I could try to go out and buy the individual security, but that's not what people do. And so we saw an incredible rise in correlation on the events. And we've seen an incredible rise in correlation on the recoveries as well. I'm interested in this whole discussion of correlations, because one of the things that comes to me as I think about the amount of liquidity coming into the market, the amount of passive flow, is that you're seeing a suppressed amount of volatility. It's holding things down. Uh, so, you know, under the mean variance framework that most of the super funds and portfolio managers use, it's encouraging them to take risks that are going to ultimately hurt them. Well, I, I think it has two impacts, right? So unquestionably, there's been a rise in correlation. And in particular, there's been a rise in correlation when you adjust for the level of volatility, right? So if the market rises 10% on a day or falls 10% on a day, which is an extraordinary move, just to be very clear. I have to have a high degree of expectation that most of the stocks are going to be going in the same direction, right? It's very hard for a market to rise 10% or fall 10% without the vast majority of the stocks moving in the same direction. One of the byproducts of much lower interest rates and the need to seek out alternate forms of yield has been the rise in what's referred to as volatility selling. There has also been significant increase in interest in, in various strategies that, um, sell various forms of insurance, right? So fixed income strategies are, are actually a way of insuring the equity providers, right? By offering a fixed turn, you're effectively selling them a put. Those strategies contribute to a decrease in observed market volatility on a local basis, right? So the very small moves of kind of zero to 0.25% 0 in markets, similar to what we're seeing in, in equity markets right now, this level of depressed realized volatility, that conceals a much higher level of correlation um, when we adjust for that factor, right? So if we hold volatility constant and we look at a correlation on a volatility adjusted basis, we're at levels of correlation in markets that we've just never seen ever in history before, right? I've got data series back into the 1930s. We're at levels that are dramatically higher than that once we adjust for the underlying level of volatility. So then for the institutional investors, you know, the, ultimately the listeners here, you know, how do you then talk to them about asset allocation? Because asset allocation now needs to be totally rethought if uh, this is the underlying uh, issues that they need to consider of, of correlation being uh, much higher than usual. Right. So, I mean, one of the things that we know is, is that a higher correlation basically means a loss of diversification benefit. So the S&P 500 or the ASX, they, first of all, they run higher at a higher correlation on a cross asset basis. The irony is, is that when you talk about rejiggering asset allocation, I would actually argue that the rejiggering of asset allocation is largely responsible for the rise in that correlation. So again, the articulation that markets have a beta and that if you want a beta you know, exposure, you should just buy the index ignoring all of the individual companies, that by its very nature leads to a rise in correlation amongst the components within that index. If I then think about a automatically rebalancing strategy that has me in US equities plus Australian equities plus UK equities plus you know rest of world equities plus some bonds, et cetera, and I continually rebalance that portfolio so that my exposures remain at some target level. And I can do that on a continuous basis. I can do it on a monthly basis, a quarterly basis, et cetera. I'm actually creating feedback loops that cause an increase in correlation amongst the asset classes, right? On extreme moves, they tend to operate in the opposite direction, but in normal moves, effectively, the same amount of money is flowing into each in proportion to its overall market cap. We begin to see this rise in correlation. That's exactly what we've seen, right? So what I would argue that we've misunderstood about the markets goes back to the earlier observation around the efficient market hypothesis and this idea of elasticity or inelasticity. If we assume that markets can absorb all the capital that we throw at them and the objective of markets is to allow people to save for retirement, we're going to get very different outcomes than if we assume that markets are designed to facilitate the access to capital from corporations. Right? They're just they're, they're radically different. And unfortunately, policymakers seem to have latched on to the idea that the whole purpose of markets is to allow households and businesses to you know, ensure a, a future cash flow need, a retirement need, and that the job of governments and particular regulators is often to step in when it appears that markets may not meet those objectives. In other words, if the market falls, 
something has to be done to get it back higher again. Very caustic behavior. So what does that then mean for institutional investors? It's just, you know, if they see that and they're trying to front run that, it just means keep allocating more and more to to equities, right? Because if, if the perception is that it will always be saved, um, that there's no chance really of loss and be a long-term investor, go short volatility and stay on that path. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's exactly what we're seeing, right? So, I mean, this is the dialogue of the Fed put or the central bank put, right? Uh, Mario Draghi will do whatever it takes. You know, um, my analysis is, is that the rising markets have less to do with low interest rates. They have much more to do with the rise of passive on a global basis. Again, the U.S. markets are leading that process and, and it's an exponential function. So the further you get passive, the more volatile and the more a market is going to rise on my analysis. Um, so the U.S. markets are leading. And despite the fact that the U.S., you know, that we interpret that then as the U.S. economy is stronger or that, you know, that there's information content there versus the rest of the world. I, I'm not entirely sure that's correct. I had a conversation yesterday with a group of Indian investors and some of the stuff that's happening in India is remarkable. Right. And yet India is actually losing share in global market cap relative to the U.S. markets. Why? In part because many of the retirement vehicles don't even that you know if you're in a 401k in the United States and you and in, you invest through what's referred to as a target date fund, which is similar in some ways to many of the balanced superannuation strategies, they don't even see India. They have a zero percent allocation to India, right? The world's second most populous country that's making incredible reforms, and no money is flowing to it. That's an oversight. I think that creates opportunities, but the irony is, again, going back to the structure of market theory, if the behavior of markets is influenced by the flow of capital, which we know to be the case, then that lack of flow of capital can cause the Indian market to underperform, right? And capital being withdrawn from market like Australia or elsewhere can cause those markets to underperform relative to the US. Perversely, again, changing the character of, of the investment profile, the investor profile from active to passive, from somebody who is considerate and thoughtful about what are the future prospects of the individual company or the market based on some expectation of forward cash flows, as we remove that and replace it with blind algorithms that simply say, did you give me cash? If so, then buy you're going to end up with very different structures going forward. And as a society, we don't know where that ends. We don't know what that means at the, at the end, right? I, I've run simulations on it. And I can tell you it's not pretty, but, you know, that's, you know, that 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 unfortunately is my analysis and uh, I'm not running the regulatory authorities at this stage. Well, one of the things that sort of comes to mind though, is if I think through what you've been telling me, if I sit at a, at a super fund in Australia and I'm trying to make sure that I don't, uh, underperform, I either go passive because I can't underperform, or if I want to look for potential opportunities to get some additional active risk, maybe go to places where there's this flow of capital. You know, So I'm, I'm actually perpetuating the problem even further. Uh, unfortunately, this is exactly the case. And, and for me, part of the irony is, is that you know I have had to embrace that having done the analysis and come to those conclusions. It's exactly what I'm doing with, with Simplify, right? So at Simplify, we, we pursue market indices and then we're modifying those return streams through the use of derivative overlays, right? So we're we're buying call options to increase the return or adding leverage to increase the return and simultaneously buying protection to the downside. Because that's really the only opportunity that you have is to effectively play the game that everybody else is gravitating to, be there first, but recognize the game is more volatile on a look forward basis than it's been in the past. And so to take advantage of those features as well. But you're 100 percent correct. And in, in preparation for this call, I, I reviewed some of the you know language that's going around Australia. You, you know, there was a, a, a piece that I, that I highlighted to you that was, you know, maybe the mar- maybe, maybe the superannuation funds are moving away from indexing because Vanguard is withdrawing from the market. Right. Vanguard was the white label behind a lot of superannuation funds in Australia. With the change in regulations last year that effectively require the asset managers to meet or exceed benchmarks, and if they fail to do that, then they get kicked out, right, for all intents and purposes. Vanguard actually stopped providing those services and withdrew. The interpretation of this article is, oh, well, this is an opportunity for Pat, for our active management to come back, right? They're going to move in this direction to try to outperform given these restrictions. The irony is, is it's actually 180 degrees in the opposite direction, right? The, the, the regulatory changes have skewed the game so far in favor of passive now 
that Vanguard is very intelligently saying, why would we provide the services for anyone else? We're going to stop doing it for you and we're going to just wait for you to get kicked out and we're going to come into the Australian market directly and own the customer. And that's exactly as we and I were talking before the show, that's exactly what's happening. It's a it's an incredible time and and uh, it's ultimately I guess the only person that loses at the at the end is the retiree um, because you're hoping that you're not going to be the last person into this market. Well, and unfortunately, I think I think the person who loses when you say the retiree loses those who are retiring now or in the near future actually benefit from this process because their assets get bid up. The group that loses is the younger generation because the inflation of uh, inflation, not literally meaning price increases for consumer goods, but the inflation in terms of rising valuations that occurs for financial assets, the younger generation doesn't experience that in their income in their incomes. And as a result, each dollar that they set aside to save buys less and less share of the uh, of the national wealth, right, or international wealth if we we're investing on a global basis. Unfortunately, that sets them up to be underrepresented and makes saving for their retirement goals very difficult. And I would point to an intuitive sense of this unfairness and, and this failure of the market to echo something you said earlier, where we have an improper theory of the market structure. I, I think this is driving a lot of the distress that we see in the younger population and their frustration with the existing systems as it, as it is today. It's funny, you don't seem to hear that discussed in some of the ESG conversations, uh, particularly in the Australian marketplace. Well, I think it's much easier to focus, you know, it, it's easy to understand the big story of, you know, the earth is warming and it's going to be disastrous and therefore we should, you know, eliminate carbon and, and we can influence markets in that way, right? Now, think of, of course, of the irony of ESG, right? We're going to influence the cost of capital for these companies. We're going to uh, not invest in them and therefore it'll become more expensive for them to fund new projects and to operate than if they were to become good corporate citizens, marry that up against the efficient market hypothesis that says markets are nearly infinitely elastic, so our flows have no impact, right, or very, very little impact, and the two can't be reconciled. So we know that there's something intuitively, you know, messed up in in terms of the way that we're thinking about the markets. But I completely agree with you that the real ESG story is actually that, that we're ignoring the young, and that makes perfect sense when you think about it from the standpoint of a financial asset manager, right? Because my job is to manage financial assets. Young people don't have them. Young people are long human capital, right? They have future working careers in which they can generate income by providing services to the rest of the population. And what they're hoping to do is to deploy the excess of that, their savings, into vehicles that allow them to save for retirements. But since they don't have any assets today, why should I waste any time developing strategies for them? It's a, it's a real challenge. Um, and at the moment, there's a bit of a debate, obviously, around what can be done to help these millennials, particularly that are starting to include money, uh, and their money is pulled into broader groups with people of all ages. So there's a, always a bit of to and fro uh, around the activists that are sort of pushing for change in the portfolio and the people that are coming up to retirement that don't want their portfolios to be impacted. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And again, it's, you know, it is, there is no easy answer to this. Right. Because I've described it elsewhere as, you know, we're driving a car uphill. The car has no brakes, but that doesn't matter as long as we're driving uphill. Right. It's only going to matter once we start going downhill. And on a global basis, that downhill is we, we can't know exactly where it is because there's a lot of competing currents. But on a global basis, the baby boom generation, the population boom that existed following World War II, they're now moving into retirement and the consumption of those financial assets to to pay for stuff in their retirement. It's really unclear how this is going to play out, right? We just don't have a historical precedent for it. I'm curious around that whole piece because that is the next part of the conversation in the Australian market. The accumulation system seems to be set pretty clearly. But there's now a lot more focus on retirement and retirement annuity style products. I guess the biggest question is then what do we do when you start to get 100,000 people every couple of weeks that are retiring and now looking to either take an income stream or actually sell down large parts of their portfolios and pay down debts. Many people are now 60, 65 with still very high debts in the Australian market. And so I do wonder what will then potentially happen to markets in this environment with a lot of passive style vehicles that now people just basically sell at any price. 
Yeah, so I mean, this is the this is the core of the issue, right? Because the other side of the algorithm that says if you give me cash, then buy, you know, is if you ask for cash, then sell. What's the right price at which I sell? Well, whatever the market is giving me at that point in time, you know, there's a fascinating statistic that comes out of the U.S. markets for March of 2020, which is that Vanguard revealed that less than one percent of their client accounts transacted in an abnormal fashion. Right now, in the U.S. markets, I can tell you from from very front row observer status, we came very close for markets failing. Right, the market liquidity completely evaporated. The market's ability to absorb transactions disappeared. And the, the the question I would just pose to people that take comfort in the fact that that people were trained in that way to not respond is, well, what if it had been two percent? Right, what if two percent had decided to sell? The simple answer is is that the markets probably couldn't have absorbed it. And so to your point of now you're talking about millions and millions of people moving over that and simply by virtue of their age starting to sell, regardless of a perception of the underlying state of the economy, they have their individual needs that they need to be able to buy, you know, tuna fish in cans and uh, mushroom soup and very basic staples as they try to sell down to achieve those that, that consumption need. It becomes harder and harder, and and the traditional approach as, that we had as a society for retirement, there were basically two avenues. One is is that um, you died early, right? So you didn't get a retirement. The second was that if you extended your life beyond a quote unquote normal expiration date, you relied on your children, you lived with your children, and you were aligned with them in terms of the of the objectives, right? You would take the assets that you had accumulated and provide it to them in terms of an inherited house or you would facilitate their being able to work by providing childcare, et cetera. Now, weirdly, you have those groups in opposition with each other, right? So imagine that we're 10 years off into the future and you know you want to take your retirement and you're invested in a market. And the question is, should companies reinvest and create new jobs or should companies reduce their investment and pay dividends that allow you to fund your retirement? Well, that's a conflict that really historically has not existed. And now we're going to have to come to terms with that. What do we do as a society? Where do we place that emphasis? Do we place it on the old or do we place it on the young? And I I would point out that, you know, coronavirus gives us a preview of this. We very clearly place the priority on the old. Well, that's going to create even more uprising you could only expect, unfortunately. Um, another another issue of the ESG whole environment that needs to be discussed you know, in, in, in much more detail. I wanted to come back to another piece that you were talking about, which was around the ability to create option strategies and capture some of these convexity. I'm curious, because you talked a little bit about the flow, how much does flow and liquidity of the underlying assets you know, play a role in where you actually put on some of these trades? So the, the 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 answer is it plays a role. We have to be cautious in terms of because we are an ETF provider, we have to be somewhat thoughtful in terms of how aggressively we're customizing that behavior in part to facilitate the creation process of the ETF. We need to be aware of that. But the flows that come into markets or that other actors are playing in markets unquestionably play a role in our selection criteria. So the awareness of the popularity of income generating strategies like call overriding influences my willingness to buy options, right? The demand for out of the money puts in order to protect portfolios, the view around that or the behavior that people have around that will influence where I find the cheapest vehicles to express my trades in. So the, the answer is, is that the flows absolutely play a role. I would argue that the the area that we're probably the most different from most is that we're doing this within a regulated mutual fund and ETF type environment that really couldn't have been done in the United States until October of last year. So in the United States, there was a quiet but very substantive change. Uh, It's referred to as the derivative rule. It's the first substantive change to the Investment Company Act of 1940, basically since 1979. And it allows a systematic utilization of derivatives and leverage in a way that has never been used before. And so, you know, part of what we're doing at Simplify is taking advantage of that rule change to embed protection inside portfolios and to do so in a very tax efficient manner. Our target market tends to be the the wealthier individual or the registered investment advisor who is managing individuals' assets. Uh, The challenge of protecting those portfolios is increasingly, it's becoming increasingly difficult 
with the loss of income from high yielding bonds and various other components, right? So increasingly people rely on equity strategies that's influencing our overall philosophical outlook, which is we need to provide people with access to equity strategies that have modified payout structures. So they aren't exposed to the extreme moves in the, to the downside and do a better job of capturing the extreme moves to the upside. Is it fair to say then it's ultimately like almost a, a beta strategy with convexity attached to it? And- if you go to our website, you will see it's all about convexity. <laughs> so <laughs> that is exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to create uh, non-linear payout structures that take advantage of the change in regulations. And we're, you know, candidly among the first that are doing it in this way. Continuing on with the convexity topic, uh, the whole asymmetric return outlook is is also part of some of the institutional uh, opportunities that are out there for, for portfolio managers. And cryptocurrencies has typically been seen in that space. Curious to get your views on, on crypto as a way to potentially capture some asymmetric returns, but also some of the, the pitfalls as well. So I think that there's two separate components to crypto, and I, I'm increasingly of the view that, you know, I mentioned the idea that the investment world, the, the financial asset manager world, we've largely focused on developing strategies and investment products for the older generation, because that's where the money is, right? It's like Willie Sutton, you know, where, where do you go? Why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is, right? Why do you work with old people? Because that's where the money is. The younger generation, to a certain extent, is rebelling against that and saying, look, the products that you're developing are unappealing and uninteresting to me. I've got my entire life ahead of me in which I'm going to be working and trying to earn money. I want to invest in some higher volatility, riskier strategies that give me a quote unquote breakout potential of meaningfully changing my future. For the most part, we don't offer those products in traditional finance and and the crypto markets have worked very hard to offer people exactly that, right? So instead of earning 0.2% on the cash that I put into my bank, I could theoretically take the money that I earn and deploy it into a decentralized finance uh, yield farming algorithm and make 15, 20, 30, 40%, right? Now I'm taking on a tremendous amount of risk, but I'm taking on that risk with a small sum of capital relative to my future earning potential. And so I'm willing to actually take that risk. So I think there's actually an, there's a very serious rebuke for the traditional finance world that we've failed to consider what type of investment strategies are optimal for somebody at the start of their life. We tend to approach it from the standpoint of what comes first is protecting the nest egg that you've already built, not actually in, in uh, magnifying the optionality for the younger generation. The second thing that I think is important about cryptocurrencies or crypto more broadly is understanding that that there is a very important distinction between the speculative asset cryptocurrencies and effectively the the individual uh, assets that are offered. So the Bitcoins, the Ethereums, et cetera, of the world, those individually are speculative assets that may or may not become important members of the financial landscape 10, 15, 20 years down the road, right? In the same way that Yahoo no longer exists and Google has become a dominant global force, right? We just don't know. It's too early to know on that standpoint. But what we absolutely do know is that this is accelerating a transition to truly natively digital instruments and smart contracts with much more rich information associated with them. And so I'll just lay it out in the simplest form. We use the phrase equity and debt as if they actually have meaning, right? But really all that is, is is it's a designation of a particular type of corporate security that has certain rights and obligations, right? Um, And those rights and obligations are expressed in the very, very simplest form, right? So an equity is really simple. It's the residual security. It theoretically has a claim on the earnings of the company if the company were to choose to distribute it in the form of a dividend, right? But the company doesn't have to distribute it. The company doesn't have to respond to anything the equity holders say. And in fact, if we look at voting components, one of the biggest changes over the past two decades has been the rise of super voting shares for somebody like Mark Zuckerberg so he can sell off his shares and retain control of his company. So functionally, there are no rights. If I look at a company like Alibaba, where you have a variable interest entity that's held offshore with literally no claim whatsoever against the onshore Chinese assets, you can't tell me that there's anything meaningful in that underlying structure, right? You're, you're, you're fully relying on somebody to have your best interest in heart that doesn't have to have it. The digitalization process, the transition from paper securities to digital securities that lay all that out 
without my having to dig through a 10K, without my having to dig through all the covenants associated with a bond structure. And so that it's easily decipherable by auditing software or uh, in electronic form. In my opinion, that's inevitable. We're heading in that direction. It's going to move slowly because the regulatory environment is, of course, slow to embrace it. But that's really, really important. And so to me, there's a degree of inevitability that's happening with digitization, tokenization, smart contract type dynamic. And there's also a degree of ridiculous speculation around the idea that, you know, Bitcoin is going to become the next global reserve currency. I, I certainly hope not, because if Bitcoin does become the global reserve currency, we're all in for a world of hurt. There's a very, you know, the, the discussion we had earlier about the old versus the young Again, part of the irony is, is that the younger generation is embracing this idea that Bitcoin could become the reserve currency. Unfortunately, when you have the hardest money, right, or the idea that there can be no response from a regulatory or a monetary or a fiscal authority to mistakes that happen, right, improper allocation of which, we, again, we started with, you know, that's why we want to have flexible monetary basis. That's why you want to be able to respond to the fact that, well, everyone thought X was going to happen. And instead of X happening, we only got 50% of X. And therefore, a ton of debts were taken on that can't be repaid, right? As a society, you want to actually have elements of forgiveness there where you don't hold to that contract. It works for the importance of social cohesion and goes back to what you highlighted in terms of the, the riots, et cetera. Bitcoin doesn't fix this. The idea of going to the hardest money actually makes it harder and harder to do that. And I'm, I, I'm sympathetic to what the younger generation is saying there, because part of what they're saying is, look, we saw this with coronavirus. You're going to choose the old people, right? So we want to take the ability to make a choice away from you, right? I understand it, but it's not actually correct, right? I mean, what we need to do is, and it, it's painful and it sounds ridiculously naive, but we need to vote better. We need to put people in offices in office that actually are going to look at this from a long-term strategic standpoint and say, hey, we really have to focus our emphasis on children and those, and, and those who are in the next generation if we hope to have a stable and robust society going forward. Mike Green, that's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you very much for your time today. Alex, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. All views expressed on this podcast are subject to change and do not necessarily reflect the views of Connexus Financial. This podcast is for educational purposes only and should not be relied upon as investment advice.